Hey everybody, we are Martin, Robert, and Francis, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Hey everybody, welcome back to Snakes and Otters. This is episode 41. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. So today is going to be another one of those, we call them reach-back episodes. We go back and pull a nugget out of something we've already talked about. And give it a little bit of an exploration. We've done this a couple of times. You know, we did uh, Jack Kirby when we talked about comic books. We pulled that nugget out and elaborated on it. And this time we're going to go back to our Robert Kennedy episode. You know, we did a big episode of what if. What if Robert Kennedy's not killed in June of 68? What happens? And from that, we started thinking about, well... What about the 72 election, though? Why was uh, Nixon this juggernaut? And just how bad a candidate was George McGovern? Because, as we know, the Watergate scandal breaks before the election. Yeah. Um, So that's tonight. That's what we're going to do today, or tonight is... Just how bad a candidate was George McGovern in 1972? What led to this giant... Um, Overwhelming landslide. Yeah, over, landslide, that's the right word. What was oh, this yeah, landslide it, yeah, it was, for Richard Nixon in 72? Yeah, I mean, Nixon gets 520 electoral votes in 49 states. <laughs> McGovern only gets 17 electoral votes in one state plus D.C., you know, he, that's that's pretty much as a bad and electoral ass whipping as you can get. That's right. Yeah, only I think Reagan did better against Mondale. And I think that's the only one. Yeah, only because there was more electors. Well, no, there's not more electors, but the state that that Mondale won was smaller. Right. <laughs> so, McGovern only won Massachusetts, <laughs> right? Whereas <laughs> Mondale won Minnesota, <laughs> so he got thirteen. I think. I think that's yeah. That yeah. Sounds uh, right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I don't know that the, if the question, and this is where what I find fascinating, because I don't know if the question is so much how bad a uh, candidate is McGovern as it is how did the press not make this a bigger issue? Oh, yeah. We talked about that in the show prep. Because, you know, if something like this were to have something like Watergate were to break uh, some five months. Prior to the, because that's when the the, scan, right. the break in happens five months before the yeah, election. We're going to do a timeline to make it make sense. If that were to happen today, no matter who the candidate is, I don't see that person getting elected, Democrat or especially Republican, but you know, almost definitely not a, a, a Democrat. So, what was going on with the press? I, to me, that's more fascinating than how bad a candidate. Yeah. McGovern yeah, is, we, we need to hit that. I think there's. I think it's probably a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. Well, how much has the press changed from then to now? Well, and that's a that's deal part of that it. too. That's right, yes. exactly. So, little timeline. Let's talk timeline. Yes, timeline. Just, so it'll make some sense. Obviously, Nixon wins sixty-eight. He's inaugurated in sixty-nine. Um, beginning in nineteen seventy-one, he begins to have people around him um, that are, I guess you'd call it an expression of what we came to view later as his paranoia. Mm. Um, The enemies list. Right. The enemies list was a real thing. Uh, That's just not a metaphor. They actually wanted to put the uh, mechanisms of the federal government into play uh, to punish political opponents. And... um, Howard Hunt, Gordon Liddy um, become the White House plumbers, and they are charged with stopping leaks. Hence the, hence hence the, the name, name plumbers. Yeah. Um, so you're starting to have people with this kind of background being brought into the White House and brought into what's called the Committee to Reelect. And Liddy, in his autobiography, Will, which I've read, he is part of the driving force behind all of these things that um, are planned as operations going into the 1972 election. 
Um, John Dean's involved. Uh, John Mitchell's involved, and, and lots of other people around the president are involved. Eventually, it comes to where they plant microphones. Wait, you said John Dean. Isn't that rat bastard, according to G. Gordon? According <laughs> to G. Gordon Liddy. Oh, absolutely, yes. yeah. Uh, he's, Anyways. Uh, no love lost. Well, yeah. well, that's an interesting thing. The only reason I bring that up, and maybe this has to do with the timeline, Dean is the one who basically gives everybody up. Is I mean, they're caught, obviously, but I mean, I think he's the one... That rats everybody out and right. spills the guts about the details. He was so guys like Liddy. He kept his mouth shut. Yeah, right. Yeah, Dean would eventually. Uh, he's kind of the go-between right from the start, anyway. Yeah, doesn't he According supervise the other guys? He's any kind of over them. Mitchell sort of? is Mitchell moves from attorney general to chairman of the committee to reelect. So Mitchell's really the boss. Okay. Dean is kind of the go-between, and this is according to Liddy. Sure. Um, Dean's the go-between, but again, Ehrlichman's involved, Haldeman's involved. A lot of these guys get involved after the break-ins because Dean is going to the president and going to them saying, these were our dudes. These, these, they, they were working for the committee, and they've gotten caught. Um, but that's the next thing in the timeline. That's The actual break-in is June 17th, where they're caught famously. They tape the doors open. Mm -hmm. The security finds it. Back in the 70s, that was kind of a common thing for cleaning crews to tape the door locks open so they can go through without keys. But when he finds the door locks taped a second time after he's removed them, the security guard calls police. Right. And so the burglars are caught. Again, that's June 17th, 1972, in the, White, uh, in the Watergate complex. Um... But already beginning three days later, in June 20th, um, Woodward and Bernstein are already investigating for the Washington Post. Right, because Deep Throat's already tipped. Yes. Deep Throat, who we find out just a few years ago, is Deputy Director of the FBI, Mark Felt. Um, but he's tipping them off that Howard Hunt, Gordon Liddy, these people are involved. Charles Colson is involved. And so there's starting to be a nexus now that are starting to weave things at least to the committee to reelect, possibly not to the White House, but at least to the committee. So, for listeners who obviously, you know, we're in our early fifties, so we're of an age where this is just barely memorable for us. Yes, we remember the event, but not all the details. So the committee to reelect would that be the same uh, nowadays as the official campaign, a portion of it, essentially, or yes. a what we now call a PAC? No, this would have been his committee to reelect. Okay, because we don't call them that. This now. is the official campaign. Right? Got it. This is not a PAC. It, it is the campaign. Okay. Um, it's more directly connected to the candidate than um, a PAC would be. Right. People right. supporting That's what I just them. want to clarify because yeah. we just don't use this that, terminology. Because that's essential. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, um, you know, these are the people that are handling the donations. And, of course, that's part of it, too, that eventually comes out is they're not able to take the donations and, quote, launder them. Um, they eventually discover that Checks that were written to the committee in good faith ended up in the hands of the burglars, basically, as their payment for, for their activities. Ah, okay, yes. So, well, um, yes, because you can't write a check from the committee to them, but <laughs> you can hand it off for them to cash. Right, they must have been checks made out to cash because... Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. banking it was probably a lot looser in those days. Well, could, yeah, but I mean... A friendly banker, you could probably get away with this. But checks can be traced. That's yeah. correct. Checks can be traced. And again, people that were innocent, writing checks to the committee in good faith for the re-election of the president, that's money that was then funneled to the burglars as payment. Uh, that comes out later. Um... But again, when you're still talking about 72, summer of 72, um, Haldeman recommends to Nixon that they attempt to shut down the FBI investigation by having the CIA intervene. It's a huge no-no. Yeah. On so, so many levels. That's really, that's the, the kernel of the cover-up then is 
trying to get the FBI to back off on the investigation by claiming it's national security, it's CIA stuff. So that begins... Which, in a way, because this is, this, this is still after laws have been passed that the CIA can't operate on U.S. soil. Yes. So even if they say it's a national security thing, they're still breaking the law. So that's not even a good cover-up. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Weak. Yeah, I, at best. Yeah. Um, I guess it's easier for the agency to take the heat than to continue to let individuals associated with the campaign. That's right, because there's take no, the heat. there's no uh, there's no blockage between the president and that campaign. Right. Whereas yeah, CIA, direct. you've got plausible deniability. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they're they're grasping at straws. Yes. Definitely. So a big date though before the election is September fifteenth. Howard Hunt, Gordon Liddy, James McCord, and the rest of the burglars are all indicted by a federal grand jury. So how public is this? Indictments are public. Okay. So this is people who are on record as working for the committee and who have been in the White House. They aren't there now. But McCord, Liddy, and Hunt are well known as people who have worked in the White House and who have worked in at the committee. Right, okay. Because so, and the press knows all this. Right, but what you just said is, is key there. So they've, they're known to have worked in the White House, but if they're not now, they're still not tied directly to the president. Right, and that's the key right there that I think is a big part of this. Again, Libby goes into this because they all basically shut up. At this point before the election... You're not able to tie any of this to Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Colson, Dean, or any of those guys yet. Right. The trial's not going to happen until early January, right? That's correct. The trial so, is not until January of 73. All right. So that right there is going to basically stop all of the, or most of the legal evidence gathering uh, as far as being, you know, you know, it's not going to be brought out and tried because... That's going to be relatively secret for the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, any evidence they gather, they have to share with the defense, but they don't have to release it to the public. Whereas today, that's going to get leaked. I don't care who it is. Mm -hmm. Because somebody's going to leak it. Yeah. So that's really the last kind of big reveal, big event prior to the election, is the indictment of Hunt, Liddy, uh, McCord, and the burglars. So it's not really until the following March of 73, McCord is the guy that was recruited in by Liddy to be the electronics expert. He had worked, uh, I believe it was in the FBI, as an electronics expert. And he writes a letter to the judge in the case and says... There's more to this, basically, than what we're talking about in court. It does go higher. And um, in April is when John Dean begins cooperating with the prosecutors. And from there... The hearings begin. The hearings and, and everything. And we get to the revelations about the taping system and... Um, you know, the, the missing, was it 18 minutes? 18 minutes. Yeah, and, and all of that. and, and um, Yeah, once the trial begins and evidence is presented, everybody knows it. Yeah. So I think that's probably key to what's going on here is that before evidence is presented in court, the public just isn't going to be aware of it unless Dean has leaked it, or not Dean, um, um, Felt has leaked it to... Woodward and Bernstein. Yeah. So I'm guessing he must not have been leaking much between the indictment and the election. And the FBI may not have developed a whole lot at that point either. Right. Beyond this is a burglary that we are. So uh, essentially the burglars themselves and the rest of the White House staff are able to play a classic four corners defense until November. Still, though, you would think that even with a little bit of this shadow should have Im impacted the election in some way. 
So, still though, just how bad a candidate was McGovern? With but all what, with all of this in your back pocket, how can you not do better? I'm guessing it's a couple of things, uh, maybe three. So first, we're going to have things are going okay with the economy. Uh, inflation has not reared its ugly head. We've not had the oil shock that comes in '73. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, Nixon has gone to China. Mm -hmm. uh, he has stepped up the the war in Vietnam to where he's pushing back the Viet Cong. He's driving them to the to the point where they're going to have to start negotiating. So, for all intents and purposes, he should win, just based on on his where he's at. Uh, he's he's at this point he's a successful president. Now he's yeah he's a paranoid <laughs> yeah, yeah a but, paranoid loon. But, but that's not known. But yeah, that's not known yet. Yeah, probably doesn't know. So it. there's that. Then I think there is this. Uh, Lack of enough media outlets to gin this up. Because you're only going to have ABC, NBC, and CBS on television. Mm -hmm. And basically you're going to have the Washington Post and the New York Times. Maybe you're going to have the Chicago Trib and the LA Times for your newspapers. Those are going to be your, at best, five to seven news outlets. And they're always a day late in the sense that mm -hmm. everything happens after the fact. We're used to everything happening now. So it's a totally different media mindset. Uh, Liddy always credited the Washington Post with being the one that did the most damage. Yes. On his radio show, he would not say the name. He would beep out the word post. He would say the Washington beep. Uh, and that's kind of true is technology had not advanced to the point T both uh, communication-wise with television and with print like we are today. One of the reasons that this could never happen today is our 24-hour news cycle, which is constantly predatory in looking for stories to keep them alive and on the air. Right. It's uh, really more of a 60-minute news cycle. That's right, yeah. Because that's not even 24-hour. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, just, it's just it's constantly going on. So they're, they're looking to grab something now. They, I don't. I think this caught everybody by surprise. Well, and nobody would ever expect somebody actually had the stones to do this, uh, either to do the burglary or to try and take down well, the president. All of you above. That's right. So, and I, I know you've got something to say, Martin. Um, I, I think there's also, I just think there's more journalistic integrity. So mm. I think you have to look at the the Washington Post. They took a huge risk. And, I, and I, from what I understand, again, my, my memory is a little fuzzy on this, but it seems to me that Woodward and Bernstein had to fight to, do, to yes. get this published. Because they had a single source mm -hmm. who, was an, who was using an alias. Nobody knew who this guy was, and they weren't going to give him up. That's very important. I think it's extremely that, important. In that time of journalism, sourcing was important. Two sources. Yeah, you could, Two not, sources. You could not go to an editor... And say we've got this tip from a guy in a parking garage that the White House is involved. Right. It, it, so, but I, I just wanted to add that, you know, to younger listeners, yes, 1972 is before cable TV. Before cell phones. Before cell phones, before Twitter, before everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, <clears throat> most especially before cable TV. Yeah. That's right. the real explosion of media is, again, CNN. Yeah, that's 10 years away. Yeah, uh, it's it, not, it, not even quite ten, but right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're right. The Washington Post is in the driver's seat of news, and I'm guessing at this point that since we're talking about it's a post exclusive, they're not going to syndicate this to the other papers. So maybe it doesn't get a lot of traction in other papers in the way that it, with the same kind of detail because they you can't. Have, yeah, you, they have to use the the Washington Post as a source. They're not going to like that. Yeah, they're going to have to write their own stories regurgitating the post, Right, because they don't have felt as deep throat. Yeah. Uh, and, and one other thing, I, I, you were absolutely right, Robert, about, uh, again, Nixon does have substantial strengths going into the 72 he election. He has foreign policy achievements. He does have the North Vietnamese at the table. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I, I want to circle back a little bit about McGovern. Right. So I think we've set up why Nixon should win. Yeah. Right. But we, but we still need to, we need to delve why. into McGovern a yeah. lot. Because ultimately, I do not believe Nixon wins this election so much as McGovern loses this election. No, see, I, I, I think he wins it. I, I, there's no question he does. Well, no, no, I mean... I, don't, I think we do McGovern a disservice to not recognize how bad a candidate he really was. He really was. Well, yes. I mean, that's why I say that... <laughs> well... <laughs> It's, I guess it's both. Nixon wins, but McGovern, you know, he's he's worse than McClellan. Not only did he bring himself, but he brought everything else that goes along with it. Yeah. You know? yeah. He is a bad candidate for the time. Yeah. Um, so we'll just talk a little bit about George McGovern. Uh, probably the most leftward candidate to run for president up to that point. We would call him a socialist today. Uh, yeah. uh, he is Bernie Sanders. <laughs> uh, he was, yeah, he was talking about a universal uh, basic income in, in the 1972 campaign. But the other thing, too, that I found intriguing, we talked about this some in the, um, in the Robert Kennedy episode where there's only 14 primaries in 68. Right. After the mess of 68, the convention being a disaster and all that, and, and everybody basically feeling that Humphrey kind of stole that nomination, the Democrats put together a commission to reform their process. The mcgovern Fraser Commission. <laughs> and guess who's the chair of, right. of that is George McGovern. And the eventual outcome is that they wanted to really push this out to be all primaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we get really the process that we know today of a set of caucuses and primaries where actual voters mm-hmm. get to determine nominees. Right. But being that this is the first one, and the guy who set it all up is the guy who ended up with the nomination, a lot of the old school power brokers walked away from it and sat on their wallets. So he was at a significant funding disadvantage. And that hurts. That hurts. No matter how good a candidate you might be, if your opponent can just have a media onslaught of ads, you're at a serious disadvantage if you can't afford to come back to that. that's, That's even a little bit different back then than it is today because today... Governments no longer take matching, or uh, uh, candidates no longer take matching funds from the government because if they do, they're limited in what yes. they can spend. Back then, did they have the matching funds program? I don't recall, but McGovern was at such a funding uh, he may still not have been able to. It may not have mattered. Again, Nixon could afford to go in person. Everywhere he wanted. That's true. He's, he's and, the president. You know, he, yeah. it's the bully pulpit. And and again, his campaign has enough funding to pay for all of that. Um, and so he, McGovern, a lot of people walked away from him. He was also, McGovern was an ideological, tremendous difference. He was not even close. He, he and Hubert Humphrey were not even close ideologically. Yeah. And uh, that, I think... I know that the young people in these days, this because you know in, in seventy two, you're talking about the peace marches and things like that, the hippie movement. Mm-hmm. This is after Woodstock, after Altamont, and all that stuff. McGovern saw this as wrongly as a read of the whole nation, and he totally missed the point that Mr. and Mrs. America were just as appalled in seventy two as they were in sixty eight mm-hmm. of such what they saw radicalism. McGovern embraced that, and he did so very early, and that was not the mood of the people. Yeah, it I, was of some of the people. Yeah, I think that's a but good point. very few. That's, that's a, a good point. That's a very good point too. And also, we have to remember that in '72, you're just getting the first baby boomers into the electorate. Yeah, they are mm-hmm. not the force that they become later. Many are still in high school and college. Well, in college, they could vote. Actually, right. by this time, yes, they could vote because it's right. down to eighteen. But most of them, one. most of them probably weren't. But they may not have. Yes, right. I, I don't know what the statistics are in that. But the point is, though, that it's just the leading few years that are going to be uh, eligible to vote, and 
that's something that I think is something, you know, because we think of this, the, the hippie power kids as this huge voting block. It's not yet. That's right. This is still the pre baby boomer voting block controlling because the Because if you were to put it in a pie chart, they're a small sliver of a slice because you've still got all these older people that are still alive and voting. Yes. And it's only as the baby boomers reach ascendancy and grow, it's because the older ones die off. And they're very ideologically different. Yep. They have nothing in common with McGovern, whereas the hippies mm-hmm. and the baby boomers, yeah. more so. Yeah, I think that you're really on to something because, again, he did take the party probably to its farthest left extreme to that time. Uh, he ran on immediately ending Vietnam, mm-hmm. uh, which, again, I, we talked about this during the Robert Kennedy episode. This was always going to be a Nixon strength going into 72. Mm-hmm. Because of uh, what he did. Yeah, he says... You can't just immediately end because then, or you can't say you're going to because then the North Vietnamese have no incentive then to come to the table. Right. They'll wait it out they'll and then they'll out. run over uh, right. South Vietnam, which is what they did. Yeah. And so Nixon having that point of, I will end it, but I'm not going to just walk away. I can keep the North Vietnamese at the table. Oh, realistically, in hindsight, I think Vietnam, Viet, the North Vietnamese were always going to take over the South if we left. Because the South just didn't have the, the, the ability to fend off the North. That's why we were there in the first place. That's right. Yeah. So whether, they just didn't have the political unity to hold off a right. determined adversary like the North Vietnamese. So, and especially when you consider they have the uh, Chinese and, and Soviet uh, communism behind them. So no matter what, they were going to lose. So in hindsight... Whether he we walked away or not, that was going to happen. So, listeners, sorry about that clanging noise. That was the coaster coming off my glass of bourbon. So, what have we got today, Francis? Oh, this, oh, was, this is good. This, this is, is good. your stuff, right? This is right. I, uh, I have got a special, a special single barrel edition of seventeen ninety two uh, bourbon. Uh, it is made by what's known as a bourbon group. Believe it or not, uh, a good friend of mine runs the Blackout Bourbon Single Barrel Group. It's something that's very unique to this area where you get a a group of investors together and you go to one of the local distilleries, you buy a barrel and you test it, you taste it, all of them go together, they'll all pick out the one that they want and they'll have that one barrel bottled in the the bottle of uh, of the brand itself but they get to put their labels on it and they get to offer it themselves. They purchase it themselves, they bottle it themselves and they give it out to friends. And uh, that's what this is. Blackout Bourbon uh, is the is oh, the Blackout one. Racing Stable Single that Barrel is, Select that 1792. Now, 1792 it's is actually tasty. one of our favorites. Surprisingly, uh-huh. we have never had it on the show. That's right. Made by Barton Brands, mm-hmm. uh, where my mother used to work actually years ago. Uh, at my, both of my sister's weddings, that's what we were drinking. That's where you guys remember it, I'm mm-hmm. sure. Uh, and it is amazingly good. I'm, I think we're all having it over the rocks tonight. We are. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's just a smooth... It's got a nice finish. Mm -hmm. It's It's not harsh at all. But it's very rich. Yes. It has a rich flavor, not not a weak flavor, but a full body, full flavor, but then still the smooth finish. Thanks to the good folks at Blackout Bourbon uh, Group for providing this to us. Uh, I told them we'd feature it on an episode. They said, really? And I said, yeah, make sure you listen. So it's some great stuff. So some more about McGovern. We talked about the, again, he wants to end Vietnam immediately. He wanted to do a guaranteed minimum income. Again, this is not only out of step, really, with where the American electorate is at this moment, but it's really out of step with the rest of the party. It is. Nobody's talking about that. Yeah. That's, uh, that is extreme socialism, is what yeah. it would have been called at the time, yeah. even though they didn't use those words very much. And then, so, he's really out there almost alone. He, mm-hmm. he can't get a, even a running mate. Right. He's not good at building coalitions. Yeah. He's a th- um, he's a professor. He's a thinker. Uh, he's he's some- done social work, essentially what we call social work now. He's led charitable organizations. Right. Um, I, I think the interesting thing about him is that today we would almost it's almost impossible for somebody to come from South Dakota and get the nomination. State's not big enough. Well, that's correct. He didn't bring anything to the table on that. He was right. a poor hero, but most of his generation had something like that. So that kind of helped him a little, made him palatable. Uh, that's why the most Democrats would say, "Okay, he, he fought in the war. We'll go with that." Sure, that's it's very rare up until modern you know, modern times contemporaries with us 
for a president not to have had military service. Uh, it's just, you just look back and it's yeah. just very rare. Now, the interesting thing, I go back to the South Dakota thing. I think the best way to put how bad a candidate he is is he didn't even win his own state. That's correct. That's right. Even uh, Jimmy Carter in 80 wins Georgia. Uh, Pretty sure. I think, that's, I think that's the one he won. <laughs> yeah, well, I think he won more than one, but yes, he did he, win Georgia. Well, exactly. Yes. I know it yeah, wasn't yeah. all he won, but it was almost all he won. Yeah, almost <laughs> all he won. Yeah, he didn't win many. Um, so, and McGovern is having so much trouble finding even a running mate. He settles on, I believe it's Thomas Eagleton. That's correct. The first yes, one, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Senator from Missouri. And... That even goes astray. They didn't do enough research, and it emerges that Eagleton has undergone psychiatric electroshock <laughs> electroshock therapy yes. as a treatment for depression. I'm sorry, but if you got to get shocked for depression, it's some serious business in '72. Yeah. Yes, and yes. it I, was it, not well known. That's another thing about McGovern. That's kind of what we're circling the drain on here. Is he his his apparatus? Is weak. Well, he has no money. He has no money, and he has very little support. So, of course, he's not going to be able to vet these guys right. The machine was not behind him. Right, because you need the machine to do a lot of this because right. there's no internet to do the research for you. Right. It's not something yeah. you can't hire some kid who's 20 years old and stick him in front of a computer to get all your opposition research. That's correct. You've got to really do the work yeah. in a hard way. Yeah, so he has this debacle with Eagleton. He has to push Eagleton off the ticket. Bring in Sergeant Shriver, who's a, uh, a Kennedy associate. Right, well, he's a brother-in-law. Yeah, brother-in-law. Yeah. Uh, Father-in-law to Arnold, Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Yes, uh, he's the the he and uh, his wife Eunice, who was a Kennedy. Uh, they are the parents of Maria Shriver, mm-hmm. whom we know in modern days today as married to the great Arnold Schwarzenegger. Formerly, formerly, that is correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes, that uh, that went uh, off the rails some time ago. I'm afraid. Yeah. So, you're right, this really exposes a ton of weakness here uh, with McGovern. And it, the, the Nixon campaign was able to really portray him not only as too far left, but really as a complete incompetent. Uh, once you start to expose it, well, he, he can't even pick a decent uh, number two for the ticket. You can get some traction that way. Do you think Nixon steamrolled over McGovern? Or was it McGovern the problem himself? I think it's both. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah. mean to set him up opposition. Yeah. Uh, so, just to show you how bad, again, go for look, it. When we look at the numbers. So, this ties into what you're talking about. How we got the nomination, I think, really is tied to restructuring the primary system. Because when you look at the vote totals, he didn't even come in number one in the raw vote count. He came in with 25.34% of the primary re- vote results. Hubert Humphrey had 4.12 million, I'm sorry, uh, 4.1 million versus 4 million, so 25.77%. He's not even running, though. I don't... Well, he, he had to have run uh, I mean, early some, on. Yeah. yeah I, he, had I, to have been on, he had to have been... Uh, somewhere on the ticket. Somewhere on the ticket. George Wallace comes in with 23.4, so basically not quite two percentage points behind McGovern for third place. Uh, Those are the top three vote getters. Uh, So he doesn't even win the popular vote of the primaries. Of the primaries, yes. And it's 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 close. I mean, that's close enough to where today that's probably a brokered convention. If they all have, if they can all stay in. Yeah. So, you know, he's he's definitely not a great candidate. He really set, but he's a great politician because he figured out how to game the system, and that's what he's done. Well, it was his system. Exactly. <laughs> Which, when, as when you, you create the, the rules, it's really easy yeah. to come out ahead. You have the and that's what he's when, done. When you design the game, you know how it's played. Exactly. And again, I think that's a big key to it. Uh, again, it was his commission that set up these rules. He got the nomination. It really frustrated a ton of the power brokers who like the old way, who like to be able to deliver um, a delegation from their state. And get something back out of it. He um, he also did something that I think helped him out, probably especially for some of those uh, uh, notable primaries, is he got a lot of endorsements compared to the other guys that were running. Hmm. 
when you look at the list, uh, former governor and secretary of commerce from New York, he's got se- uh, several senators, including Adlai Stevenson. Uh, he's got uh, former Senator Young from Ohio. He's got governor of Pennsylvania, former governor of Ohio, Ohio State Treasurer. So these are important states. Uh, he also got astronaut John Glenn. Ohio must have been really big because he got three uh, yeah, major. Ohio was, was still still was huge in those days. Um, Hubert Humphrey got Jack Sensenbrenner. He's the mayor of Columbus. McGovern got uh, Frank Church from Idaho. Again, not a large population. Uh, a senator from California. That was probably his biggest uh, endorsement. Now, George Wallace, he got former Governor Lester Maddox. That's not exactly a barn burner of an endorsement. <laughs> no, but in the South. But in, in the know, South, racism. Yes. I mean, this is not that far after the Civil Rights Act. Wallace is, you know, Wallace should have been an absolutely unpalatable candidate today because of his extreme racist views. But right. yet, at those at the time. There were still many who held that. 23.48%. That's correct. That's enough to keep you alive going into the uh, into the convention. And this is the the time when McGovern, uh, not McGovern, I'm sorry, uh, Wallace is shot. That's in, correct. In Maryland. In May 15th. So he's competitive up until that point, but his injuries basically force him essentially out of the campaign. Yeah. Right. Major issues like that. That's why the, the mental health issue was so big, is that... Your candidates had to be practically perfect yeah. back then. Well, Nowadays, we we don't care so much. Uh-huh. Wallace actually won the Michigan and the Maryland primaries. He was not just a South candidate. I mean, hmm. there was it, that was some serious business. Now, this is before he shot. He wins nothing in the West. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you're right. He so he he does win some major states, uh, mostly in the South, mm-hmm. but it, it's it's obviously not enough. Um, to me, so this thing just... this thing was shaping up to be a huge mess. Well, so, yeah, there's 15 candidates going in, and that's not unheard of. We're doing that these days anyway when it starts, but they don't fall away that quickly. Only four end up with double digit percentages right. of the vote total. Yeah, and the fourth one, Ed Muskie, he's only at 11. percent Well, there's also a scandal that he has about a Canuck letter that. Well, yeah, but my of, point is though, yeah. it, it doesn't matter who he is; he's only got 11 percent. Everybody else is in single digits. But it, it's enough of a mess just to have Wallace. I mean, again, you're talking about the guy just a couple of years before this is segregation now, segregation forever, you know, actively as the governor of a state blocking minorities from entering universities. Right. Well, it just shows how dis- still disenfranchised minorities were in 1972. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about a huge mess. That's right. Uh, uh, Race uh, relations are... not in- shot, and this thing is going down to the wire with Ooh. all of them, over, all three of those guys over 20%. Talk about a mess. Well, a yeah, disaster. because you, cause you'd have to broker a convention. That way you'd have well, to make some deals. I don't know that that would be the case, only because, again, this goes back to McGovern setting up the... the the primaries, even though he comes in second in the vote total, and those three are so close together, he's got 1,864 of the uh, delegates. Yeah. The next one is not even Wallace. It's Henry Jackson with 525. Wallace has 381. Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American to run for president, mm-hmm. actually got 151. She wins Louisiana and Mississippi. Hubert Humphrey, the guy who had the most votes... Had sixty six delegates. Yeah, think about that. This well, so then, they didn't know means, how to play this system. Yeah, but, exactly. But, but McGovern this, did. This whole primary stuff—it's all a giant mess. Yeah, it's a mess. It is so. St- I mean, I don't know what kind of reforms they did after this. Yeah, how, but I how does this it, resemble what we do today? The first attempt at this is not going to be what it finally ends up being. Yeah, right, I'm yeah. sure. But yes, this just shows how how. Oddball, the whole thing was. How, how nobody you, knew how to play. Yeah, I mean, how do you win so many votes and so few delegates? Right. How do you win the most votes and have sixty-six delegates? And just, I guess it. it I guess it's like a winner-take-all state versus. Well, that used to be the case. Winner-take-all versus, versus states that break them up on percent, which is still being done. I mean, you have to be above fifteen percent in Iowa yeah. to yeah. get delegates. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not. It's not a winner-take-all, but. I guess there must have been enough winner-take-alls, and McGovern wins by just these small percentages enough 
that he takes all the all the delegates. It has to be because yeah. because it looks like that there are some states that Humphrey wins. So how he still ends up with only sixty seven is beyond me. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, I think one of the things that uh, McGovern when he wins the uh, Massachusetts primary in April, uh, Robert Novak made an, uh, um, an amazing quotation. He's quoting some other uh, Democratic senator uh, with regards to people know, don't, don't know, the people don't know that McGovern is for amnesty, abortion, and legalization of pot. Once a middle America, a Catholic middle America in particular, finds this out, he's dead, was the way the quote worked. And it stuck. McGovern mm-hmm. later became known as the candidate of amnesty, abortion, and acid. And that became Humphrey's battle cry to stop him, especially in the November uh, primary, in the Nebraska primary, that sticks with him early. This is 72. That's radical Roe v. stuff. Roe v. Wade is still a year away. That's exactly right. This is radical stuff for most of America. And that's April. So he's being torpedoed, McGovern is, long before he's ever nominated. That's one of the reasons I think that he, you know, what we said, he brought himself to the party. He was easily characterized. And those aren't wrong. He would have been for those things. Yeah. Middle America does not want any of that. Most of them. So, how bad a candidate is he? He's probably the worst candidate any party has put up mm-hmm. in, I don't know how long. Yeah. Uh, of the major parties, he's, he's got to be the weakest. The, yeah, the I weakest, mean... The weakest candidate that I can recall from any... I mean... And, and so it's a perfect storm. Other, other than, a, like, Judge Parker again. Right. <laughs> against... Uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt in 1904, uh, talking about nominating a total unknown. Um, it, yeah, a super weak candidate. It's yeah, unbelievable. and so it's a perfect storm because Nixon's got everything in his favor, you know, Watergate aside. Uh, and McGovern has nothing in his favor. There are no pluses except with a very small number of people. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, it's a 60 to 40 popular vote split. Mm-hmm. So... When you think about that, 40% of the country still voted for the most liberal candidate to have ever run at that time. Right. That's a little telling as well of where the Democratic Party will be heading soon after this. Yeah. Uh, and maybe he's like um, uh, the 64, uh, Goldwater. Maybe he's like Goldwater. Mm-hmm. He has set the stage for those who come later. Well, yeah, there's there's some truth to that because he he you know like him or not, the fact that he was who he was when he was remade the party, the Democratic apparently Party. So. From, apparently so. Well, that and so, uh, over time. Well, that, uh, yeah, that and Watergate, uh, you know, that is a great perfect storm in and of itself because it happens right before the congressional elections. Right. So when Nixon resigns. It's almost a guarantee that the Republicans are going to lose like crazy. Right. I'm surprised any Republican got reelected at all in, in Congress. So that right there is, and they're probably the youngest candidates. You know, those are probably so. All of these things are kind of stack on one another and take the party in a new direction. Well, yeah, because all the old guard uh, and the Republican side, especially, are tainted. They're yes, out. they are tainted. Uh, th- Watergate is also how you end up with Ronald Reagan. Right, because he's the only guy left standing. Well, he's he's the quintessential outsider uh, in that he's never had a Washington job. Right. And that's important. I think that's how Jimmy Carter gets elected in 1976. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. He's never had a Washington job. But he's a governor of a state. He's a governor. and that, Governors that, usually do well anyway. That's right. And I think, I, well, I, I can go further and I'll say one of the reasons they do well, I think, goes back to this, recognizing we don't like this insular type of cannibalistic in-government type person. Incestuous. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, where it's Start all government. Because uh, since I'm the heathen, I'll put it that way. <laughs> well, yeah. You, you want somebody that knows how to run something and has been proven to do so, but is not in you know the right. swamp. The, the biggest mind. knock against governors is the usually the lack of foreign policy experience. Mm-hmm. So they always try to bring somebody onto the ticket or, that has it, or, yes. or go public with, well, so-and-so's advising me. Exactly. That kind or of thing. I'm going to pick so-and-so as my Secretary of State. Yes. So, yes, there, there's a lot of things that are going on that, that 72 looks like a total major loss for the Democrats. But really, I think it sets the stage for almost everything that comes out of the Democratic Party mm-hmm. for the next 50 years. Yeah. 
Well, you mentioned um, the 74 elections, and absolutely, Republicans were, were, they were wiped out. Wiped out. Uh, in fact, the new uh, Democratic congressmen that come in are called Watergate babies. Right. Yes. Um, right. It, 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 which and, and something the they themselves didn't earn. They just happened to be in the right place, the right, in the right party at the right time. Right. Well, that's... That's kind of like, you know, we look at how, how in the heck did Jimmy Carter get the nomination, but that's, you know, that whole outsider thing was big because of Watergate mm-hmm. as well. That's right. It's only two years. But we also look, uh, you know, not quite 20 years later, and we look at how did Bill Clinton get elected the first time, because nobody really expected that. Everybody thought Bill Clinton's run was a trial run, because it was often you, you ran twice. The first time was your get to, everybody gets to know you run. Mm-hmm. Your second time was usually your serious run. Now, that's not true so much anymore because the way media is, you can become well-known prior to running. Mm-hmm. Right. Quickly. So, yeah. But there were, there were several scandals and health issues with Paul Songus uh, that all of the major players, the ones that did run, got knocked out. And a lot of the, the old guard didn't run because at the time, Bush looked like he would be unbeatable. He just didn't have his war close enough to the election. Yeah. So... yeah. yeah. Major recession hurts the uh, election. It does. election chances. It does. So, you know, I, I, it's kind of the same thing. McGovern, he gets it because of a unique set of circumstances, just like Jimmy Carter does, just like Bill Clinton does. Just like Ronald Reagan does. Uh, and Ronald Reagan sure. he does as well. So, really, I'm coming to the conclusion that Watergate has created the politics from the last, you know, from basically the last 25 years of the 20th century. Well, you raise a good point because we look I know at... this is a segue out of McGovern, but <laughs> no, I think it's an interesting I, I segue. I think it's very, is, very much is because we talked about this at the beginning of the episode that the media is very different then. Watergate made the modern media along with technology, of course. Well, I, I, I don't know look, about that. They because... believe they have this power to make or break kings. Because now, that I think that. is important, yes. yes. And I think it establishes that there's an appetite for more immediate news. Oh, absolutely. But That's why Ted it. Turner with CNN mm-hmm. is so important. Yes. If there's well, no CNN, Jimmy Carter does way better in 80 than he does with, uh, with CNN. If there's no CNN, he doesn't lose as badly. He still probably loses. But, you know, we forget 80 was a lot closer than people remember. Yeah. It, it, but I think you're really on to something there, Francis, in that... Um, I think Watergate does establish that there is more of an appetite for news on a regular basis than just Walter Cronkite and the 6 o'clock news mm-hmm. and, and, a, and a few national scale newspapers. That's right. That's cause to, that CNN, that was, as you say, Robert, that CNN is, is viable. That it we is perhaps, this. shall we say, conceived in the ashes of Watergate. Yeah. Yeah, it would not surprise me if we went back and we, you know, if you were to interview Ted Turner, look at journals or whatever documents there might be, I'm willing to bet that he's going to start thinking about that sort of thing somewhere between 74 and 78. Cause it's going to take a couple years to get this thing off the ground. Yeah. And 79 is when they go live. Because they go live because of the Iranian hostage crisis. Yeah, that's right. And they count the days. Carter hated that counting of the days. <laughs> Well, Day, and then whatever. Nightline picked it up. And then right. Nightline picked Nightline, it up. Nightline, and that really got it. Because yes. Nightline was on re- real TV, not real cable TV, TV not cable real TV, TV. Mm-hmm. all t- the time, every night, counting its Day 312. Day and 312. Nightline was the big deal. That's when you... Just, Even though that was a late night news show, it was, that was still a big deal. It was well, right because, especially because... It, it's, right, but that's on the East Coast. West Coast, it's a very different time. <laughs> Ewing time here. So that's true. We've got we've got the whole spread of four, of four different time zones here. So a lot more people are watching this than we give them credit for. Well, I mean, they're watching it live. Back then, uh, a lot of shows that may have been shown live mm-hmm. were delayed until the time you know it would normally be. So Perhaps. if it was an eleven o'clock show on the East Coast, it still may not show until eleven o'clock on the West Coast. Correct. Uh, so I got two more things, and we'll we'll finish this up because we're at forty nine minutes. Wow. So. Um, I just want to we'll just mention here that Nixon was so confident because of their polling that basically, again, he took the money and just made personal appearances a ton. But he was not concerned about coattails. Um, he did not, which came back, of course, to Biden in that 
he did not try to bring other Republicans along with him. He froze out other people running for Congress. That is a serious mistake because a win like that, it wasn't even as big as that, and he got Reagan the Senate in 1980. Yes. Yes. Yeah, what would have happened if he had campaigned with the senators, the guys running for Senate, and the guys running for the House? What would have happened? Endorse some Senate candidates and see if he could have brought them along. But he had no coattails and basically deliberately made the decision not to have coattails, to not share any of the money. Just well, back it. then, yeah. there was less of a, there wasn't the the ideological divide between the parties the way there is now. Right. I mean, there was an ideological divide, but there was not this animus in the way there is now. They used to work together a lot they more did. than they do now. It wasn't now. seen as being an issue. Yeah, yeah. And, and I people think, even slid back and forth between parties sometimes. Right, and you got a lot of crossover votes. You got a lot of Democratic votes for Republican bills and a lot of Republican votes for Democratic bills. They were actually trying to do the work of government, not yeah. a partisan So, you know, back problem. then, this is probably the first time coattails, at least until, you know, up until, well, I guess, at, whenever there's a crisis, coattails are important. Yeah. So coattails were important for FDR. But they weren't necessarily important for Calvin Coolidge. Well, but you know Eisenhower had some. He brought he did he brought people into the Senate a right. little bit because he had a Republican. And that Congress. was a, that was you know Republicans essentially have been out of government for twenty years, right? And had been in the minority since the thirties when Eisenhower and it, it, they begin to come back in, um, kind of on Eisenhower's coattails. But the other thing I, I just wanted to sum up a little bit to circle this all back around. Again, you guys, you were right on it. You acknowledge Nixon has a. He kind of has a handful of good cards. He's got the North Vietnamese at the table. He's got detente with the Soviets. He's got China opening up to trade. He's got a good domestic record. McGovern has a campaign that looks like a shambles because he's gone through two um, running mates. Um, he's a, a mess. He's He's a... Probably the farthest left candidate, a fairly unpalatable candidate, as you said, Francis, to middle America. So, yes, Nixon has all the cards. And McGovern basically has a pair of twos. If that. <laughs> if that. I mean, so. I mean, he wins Massachusetts. And honestly, I wonder if he wins Massachusetts if Sergeant Shriver is not on the mm-hmm. ticket. Yeah. That's a very good point. Other right. than the fact that Massachusetts probably isn't going to vote for Nixon anyways. Because that's Kennedy territory. They're not going to vote for Nixon. Well, that's correct. They, they have a long memory on that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. So, dudes, that was... Uh, I, I, I didn't know we had 52 minutes in us on that one, but we Who did. Who would have thought you could go almost an hour on George McGovern? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think we explored it really, really well and really so got to the, the crux of it in that, yes, McGovern really was a terrible candidate, and Nixon managed his people... Managed to play a four corners defense, even though Watergate, even though Watergate's in the papers, it's in the Washington Post, it's on the news, yep, all to the morning. But they managed to deflect it enough to make it like it's a rogue CIA thing until after the election, and and then he realizes that winning the election wasn't everything. Yeah, you still have to face the music because yeah. ultimately it took him down. And it seems like, dude, what? How just? How much of a mess are you in paranoia? You've got all this great polling that says you're going to win. And big. And big. Why are you bothering with this? Why? So it makes it kind of plausible. Um, uh, you know, I think there's still some debate historically about, well, just really what did Nixon know? But it seems very plausible that this was undertaken on his behalf <laughs> without Certainly. his knowledge. Yeah. And... and Instead of, instead of like, what did you idiots do? He's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll cover it up. Because really, that's what got him. The, the cover up is what is, got him. Is got him is, you know. And I don't know that's necessarily a loyalty thing because if he if he wasn't going for the coattails, I don't know the loyalty is all that big to him. But I think it's more the because he's it's all about me. Yeah, I don't want to be tainted. Not realizing that he went the exact wrong way to not be tainted. Yeah. 
Well, and again, it starts with, like I talked about, the, the enemies list is a real thing mm-hmm. that's undertaken because they knew he wanted to get back at people that... Yeah, it's one thing. Everybody political. has an enemies list, even if it's only in, in your head. You know, these are the people that I don't like that don't like me. But not everybody wants to send government after them. Although yeah, right. Nixon certainly was not the first. And as we know from recent memory, not he is the not the last. No, well, and I don't mean just the current president. You know, it goes back farther than that. Back. Correct. It's not a new thing, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, yeah unfortunately. Um, Anyways, that's it's pretty amazing. Great episode, stuff. guys. I loved it. Loved All it. Right. Francis, what's next, baby? Next time we're going to back to Code of Honor. Excellent. Always the next one. Uh, we're uh, working out it as we speak. Uh, we always those are always fun. Yeah. We always do a really great job with each of us picking different quotations from who knows where. And uh, bringing them all together. So make sure you're here with us next week. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us, and please, Remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel. Yeah.